Good evening and welcome to the British School. Uh, we start tonight with some very sad news. Our dear colleague Harriet O'Neill, who was our assistant director from 2018 to 2022, passed away last Thursday after a short illness. Harriet was the world's greatest colleague and amongst her numerous contributions to the field of art history, I remember her especially for almost single-handedly seeing the BSR through the pandemic of 2020 to 22, maintaining a Herculean work rate and continuing to run our arts and humanities events virtually when it seemed that the whole world was locked in. We'll be commemorating Harriet on a more formal occasion shortly, but in the meantime, I want to pass our heartfelt condolences to Harriet's family and especially to her husband, Paolo. Tonight's lecture is the final installment in our seven part series accompanying the annual master's course in the topography and archaeology of the city of Rome. Our speaker this evening is Fabio Barry, who is associate fellow at the Warburg Institute. Fabio is a trained architect and an art historian whose early work focused principally on the Roman Baroque notably on the architecture of Borromini and Bernini. More recently, he's become widely known to classicists for his influential publications on colored marble, Byzantine church floors, Greco-Roman statuary, and the decor of the Roman domus in particular. The synthesis of both chronological strands and much more was published as a monograph for Yale in 2020 as Painting in Stone, Architecture and the Poetics of Marble from Antiquity to the Enlightenment. Described by no lesser figure than Joseph Connors as the book of its generation, Painting in Stone has already won numerous architecture and art history awards, including Apollo Magazine's Book of the Year and the Alfred Davis Hitchcock Medallion of the Society of Architectural Historians of Great Britain. More importantly, it's also taken its place on our course reading list, alongside more traditional works on the theme by Amanda Claridge, Giuseppe Lugli and Raniero Gnolli. Fabio is now engaged on a new but not unrelated project on architecture and poetry, and he's currently curating an exhibition on precisely this topic at Hay on Wye Castle Museum as part of the Hay Festival, which I believe opens tomorrow. And this is also the title of tonight's lecture, which we're recording, and with which online viewers can engage using the Q&A panel on their screens, and it takes us on the course back to our starting point in the Forum Boarium. Would you please welcome Fabio Barry and Architecture and Poetry, the Casa de Tocenzi and its inscription. Oh, thanks, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Um, now, it's a complaint, I think, that's frequently heard uh, about research uh, in the humanities, that it has few pragmatic outcomes or worse, contemporary relevance. This evening, research and outcomes are actually in perfect synchrony. Uh, I will talk about a couple of towers in 12th century Rome, but as I speak, a gang of selfless and possibly resentful folks are laboring to complete the hanging of the exhibition that Robert mentioned at Hay Castle, straddling the border between England and Wales, all of whom I've abandoned so I can come here and talk to you. Uh, I'm the curator of the exhibition, which opens tomorrow evening, so I'll be on an early flight, um, at, and I'll arrive just in time to applaud their labors and be of no real help at all. The director of Hay Castle, I, might, I should say also, is Tom True, whom some of you will remember was assistant director here a few short years ago. Uh, amongst the works exhibited is a poem by Pelle Cox, who was the first writer in residence at the British School, whom I met the last time I gave an in-person lecture here and to whom I'm now married. <laughs> That's how good my lectures are. Anyway, her, her poem is uh, inscribed on a building 
that's only just been finished in London, designed by Eric Parry, who served on the school's Faculty of Architecture for several years. And another contributor is Neil McLaughlin, who currently serves on the faculty and whose work you had a lecture about, I think, in person only a couple of months ago. Now, as you can see um, in this lovely photo, um, all the exhibits in the show are by contemporary artists. But my subject tonight is the so-called uh, Casa de Crescenti, which you see here in a beautiful photo by Christopher Lu. Now, this has gone under many names, including the House of Pontius Pilate, the House of Colla di Rienzo, and more frequently, the House of the Crescenti. All of these are wrong. The inscription uh, over the main door actually identifies the patron as Nicolaus, son of Crescens and Theodora, who built it for his own son, uh, son David. And we don't know actually anything more than that about them, despite numerous attempts uh, to link them with various kind of premier uh, medieval families. The building we see today is actually uh, only a stump of a much taller tower that was a skyscraper in medieval eyes. Moreover, this tower did not stand alone, but once the circuit of the compound in which it was built extended uh, along the banks of the Tiber, and it was one in a series of patrician compounds that lined the river, none of which survive. They, in fact, the millennial neighborhood uh, which surrounded it was swept away in the 1930s to make way for the Via del Mare and civic buildings, including the Anagrafe or public records office, to which the Casa dei Crescenzi is now a strange annex. Although many dates have been, yeah, another view of it, although many dates have been proposed for the Casa in the past, uh, and it was long attributed to the uh, 11th century, today's consensus is that it belongs to the mid-12th. The 12th century, as I'm sure you know, is trumpeted as a period of cultural renewal in Rome when the citizenry uh, re-established the ancient Senate to resist uh, an increasingly powerful and imperializing papacy. And in 1143, the Capitol Hill became the HQ of this resurgent, of these resurgent citizens, when this renewed Senate was installed in a family fortress, which was remodeled for the occasion. As I said, the, uh, the Casa dei uh, Crescenzi was a tower house, and Roman nobles had begun to build themselves fortified compounds with towers already a century earlier in the mid 11th century, and the cityscape became ever more militarized as new towers sprouted on every height and along every strategic route. Our tower was built on an important spot too, guarding the route over the Pons Aemilius, you know, what's left of it today is called the Ponte Rotto, one of the four bridges between the Abitato and Trastevere that had survived antiquity, and overlooking the small port in the river that had continued to function through thick and thin. And if you see this photo, I think it's from the uh, I think it's from the eighteen fifties. Um, you can actually see the uh, Casa dei Crescenzi at the other end of the bridge there. Now, Rome's uh, ever more numerous and ever taller towers vied with another novelty, the church bell towers that simultaneously sprang up across Rome from the early 12th century. One of the earliest was at Santa Maria in Cosmedin, built in the 1120s, and virtually a stone's throw from our building. By the end of the century, no Roman could escape the peeling bells that punctuated the church calendar. So when a new palace for the Senate was established on the Capitol, it was also given a tower with bells on, 
uh, to mark out communal time and summon the assembly. The claim of the so-called uh, Casa de Crescenzi to be the noblest Roman of them all is apparent both in the exceptional complexity of construction uh, and a line from one of its inscriptions much quoted that the house was not built out of personal vanity, but to revive the decrepit splendor of ancient Rome. Although the reuse of architectural fragments was widespread, of course, throughout the Middle Ages, our building displays such a cohesive agglomeration of choice spolia that in the 18th century, uh, Giambattista Piranesi considered it a fourth way in architecture and built upon uh, his observations in his own designs. Uh, the brickwork of the tower is just as artful, actually, uh, striped in, in red and yellow and with lines scored into the mortar joints to give the uneven and recycled bricks apparently precision joins. Everyone agrees that the undulating wall on the road that once led to the bridge emulated the attached columns on the nearby Temple of Portunus, as well as mimicking the miles of colonnaded streets that once filled the medieval city. This was a fitting civic ornament on the road to the bridge, but one that did not sacrifice the security of the occupants. I think every mention of the uh, Casa de Crescenzi uh, stresses that it is a milestone in the civic uh, consciousness about remembering and reviving a glorious past. Uh, and because our historical models still tend to uh, assume declines and renaissances. Uh, this um, is, as, as I say, it's, it's uh, always associated with the 12th century Renaissance, as though that was sort of proto-Renaissance. And in this light, we have a medieval tower whose base has been simply ennobled with spolia as a face to the street. However, I think we have to ask ourselves what antiquity meant to the Romans in the 12th century. It was certainly quite different from our hard-earned archeological knowledge today. Uh, it was a, a history of buildings shrouded in myth, um, all sorts of stories attached to them. There are an extraordinary number of um, uh, very imaginative uh, interpretations of sculpture and reliefs that fill the pages uh, of the Mirabilia written, in fact, about the time this was built. Most of the earliest towers we know were built on top of ancient monuments, which of course made impregnable foundations and already came at a colossal scale and therefore uh, provided the most commanding locations. Yet the same towers also borrowed prestige from their cl classical underpinnings, and the legends that clung to them as people forgot the facts and interpreted the images for themselves. And I'm showing you the, the Arch of Septimius Severus here on the left in the forum. When this was drawn, uh, only one tower survived. I think there were actually two because half of it was owned by uh, the Church of Cosmos and Damien and the other half by a noble family. And on the right, you see the so-called Arch of Janus, in the Forum Barrarium, which when the house of Casa dei Crescenzi was built would have been actually directly visible um, across the across waste ground, basically. So, so many of these uh, were built uh, on ancient remains, and many of these remains were themselves, I mean, almost, well, ancient, huge, hulking Roman buildings were either interpreted as being temples uh, or palaces, most extraordinary of them, of course, um, being the baths. And those palaces were also considered to be um, palaces, of course, always, almost always of Caesars. And this may have put 
the patron of our tower, tower in mind to expend as much care and resources on the base of his tower as he did. So in short, our tower may be less a partial revival of antiquity uh, than a complete synthesis of the antique medieval tower house. And of course, there's incidental symbolism to this, that at ground level, the tower was contextual with the antique surroundings upon which it had its new foundation for a new hierarchy. Okay, who was the Lord of our house? All attempts, reasonable or otherwise, to identify Nicolaus, son of Crescens and Theodora and father of David, have failed. However, there are some clues in the inscriptions. The unknown poet who composed the inscription over the main door into the building calls our Nicholas primus, primus de primis, actually primus de primis magnus. So first among the, uh, the first, the great. And that's either an aristocratic boast, he was the creme de la creme, or it's a political rank. He's the chief of chiefs. If it is a rank, then it may mean that Nicolaus was the patricius or leader of the Roman Senate that had been refounded on the capital in 1143 in popular outrage at this uh, overbearing and increasingly imperial papacy. Unfortunately, no Nicolaus, son of Crescens, is ever mentioned uh, in, as, as belonging to the senatorial ranks. But you have to bear in mind that we have no record whatsoever for senators for about 60% uh, of the second half of the 20th century, between 11, 20, 12, sorry, between 1144 uh, and 1192. And the number of recorded names anyway, varies enormously from year to year. However, had Nicolaus been the Patricius, it would make much sense of the imagery of his palace. The description of the palace of the senators on the capital in the Mirabilia uh, Urbis Romae, written during the 1140s, records a building, quote, adorned with marvelous works in gold and silver and brass and costly stones to be a mirror to all nations, unquote. Now, even if this is hyperbole, it betrays a will to compete with the ancient capital and the same appetite for splendor that Nicholas espoused in his own abode, which were he the Patricius would have been a sort of White House or 10 Downing Street en route from the capital to Trastevere. And I wonder if it can be coincidence that the Ponte Rotto is also recorded in the period as the Pons Senatorum. When the Senate was refounded, the senators erected an obelisk in front of their palace, as well as a massive statue of a lion devouring a horse, both places from which to pronounce capital punishments or sentences. If we look again at the house of Nicolaus, we will notice lions, lion protones at the end of both ends of the inscription lintel. And this is really quite unusual as far as I'm aware for a house rather than a church where they commonly underpin the columns of a porch or guide either, uh, guard either side of a doorway. Uh, and very often those are places also where justice is dispensed. Uh, the picture on the, uh, the slide on the left, of course, is the Castel uh, del Monte, uh, built a century later for the um, Emperor uh, Federico II. Um, just to, and I, I don't know, maybe somebody will tell me they know plenty of other examples, but I haven't come across them. In the 1930s, Heinz Kehler also suggested that the consuls on the house of the Crescenzi were actually taken here from the Curia, which had long since been converted to use as at the church of Sant'Adriano, but still used for sporadic meetings of what passed 
for the Senate into the 12th century. The sheer amount of spolia on Nicolaus's house might even apply, uh, imply a provocative stance in the face of the transgressions of the papacy, whose usurpation of imperial insignia had apparently been amongst the excesses that had provoked popular dissent in the first place. After all, popes and cardinals had been very recently ransacking Rome's ancient monuments for the best remaining spoils, including the magnificent suites of columns and architrave blocks in San Crisogono and here in Santa Maria in Trastevere, the latter church accessible from the long street that began on the other side of the Pons Aemilius. Dale Kinney argued more than 30 years ago that the spolia of Santa Maria in Trastevere were a deliberate demonstration of the imperial prerogatives of the Basilica's papal founder and hefty tokens in the rising dispute between city and papacy. It is worth remembering here the most harmonious and innovative feature of the church, the 104 marble medallions supporting the cornice of the nave entablature, all of which were sawn from 17 smaller spolia cornices and which constitute a micro tectonic echo of their larger selves. The figured medallions on the house of uh, the Crescenzi might perhaps be considered a forthright response. Whatever the case, one overlooked word in the major inscription of the house of the, of the Crescenzi may support the idea that this was indeed the house of a sen senator or Patricius. And that word is Lisgore. I'll show it to you when I, I put the inscription up in a minute. Previous commentators have understood only from the context that Lisgore must mean guard or sentry, but Lisgore exists in neither Latin nor any other European tongue. It can only be a corruption of another word, the most irrefutable, almost irrefutable candidate for which is Lictor. The lictors were public officers who guarded the consuls, proconsuls, and chief Roman magistrates, the decem weary, the praetors, praetors, and on occasion generals too. They followed the magistrates wherever they went, not just in public, but to their houses as well. Although their bundled rods and axe were symbols of their authority, the lictors were effectively armed bodyguards. However, what I really want to talk about is actually um, the poems inscribed on the building, which are certainly as unique as the spolia. They've been published many times since the 18th century, always with errors and uh, always with strange translations or, or, or not um, uh, foolproof translations. The first thing to say about these poems, the first thing to recognize is that they are, are artworks in their own right. They're not just something that's been written on a building because they are poetic compositions just as much as Robert Montgomery's light poem on Hay Castle completed yesterday uh, and just as much in dialogue with the building on which they appear. They appear. On the Casa dei Crescenzi, there are three poems. One is a simple couplet on the curved lintel over the now blocked doorway for those passing by on the once busy artery that led to the Pons Aemilius. And this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you who cross over by way of the excellent abode of the Quirite, Nicolaus proves what a man he is from this house. Note that the patron is a quiris, the ancient term that distinguished the citizen from the soldier. Far more challenging is the couplet on the arched window to the right of the grand entrance. 
And this reads, here I stand as a great honor to the Roman peoples. Let the effigy, effigies, proclaim who finished me the author. The building's speaking to us, but in an indistinct way. And this inscription really poses quite a problem. What is the effigy in question? Since the mid 19th century, a, a popular interpretation is that Ephigias meant some long lost bust of the patron Nicolaus, even though no portraits, new portrait statues of living people are known in Rome for another 100 years. Now, of course, an antique statue could have been repurposed as a portrait, but it's still baffling to see where this could have stood unless in front of the building or on some part of the tower, which is now missing. Carmen Baggio Rosla has very ingeniously suggested that the effigy in question was instead the console above the, uh, above the window, uh, the, the arched opening and to the left where you can see, we can see a winged genius grasping a hair by its ears. As a winged genius doubles for a victory, Nike in Greek, and a hair is Laos in the same language. She argued that this charming relief was a rebus, Nike Laos for Nikolaos. In fact, she goes further. She argues that the thriving foliage in the freeze blocks was selected to imitate his father's name as well, Crescens. Flourishing. Now, if so, of course, this would have been a bit of an insider joke, as she herself admits, the, and the optimum reader would have had to have been bilingual, although that's not really impossible in a quarter that had long hosted a Greek community. And such a riddle is not alien to the medieval minds that fantasticated about the reliefs they saw on authentic ancient monuments, as the Mirabilia attests on almost every page. Moreover, the lintel over the main door contains abbreviations or conundrums, no attempt to decipher them, and some of them are quite funny actually, um, has been convincing at all. Figures, I suppose, could plausibly also mean a painting, but then this would have had to be, say, a shutter for the window, and I've checked, and there is uh, no sign, no trace of any sort of fixing there. That was an open landing. However, what is clear is that this opening under the curved architrave is therefore not a window, but a lodger. In other words, a sort of window uh, for, of appearances for the patron, at ceremonies or processions, which we can only guess about. When he paused on the landing and emerged into the light under the arched window, perhaps in finery and regalia, he became the effigy, he became a living statue, the figurehead of his family, or if he were a senator, then or of the comune. Whatever the hypothesis, this inscription is prosopoeic, that is, the building itself speaks, which makes fine sense of qui perfecit me, who, he who completed me. Now, all this may be splitting hairs. If the building personifies its maker and his status, um, all of which the inscription can be taken to imply. However, the most effusive uh, inscription is that over the main portal, incised in a curved and canted architrave that has been turned on its side to make a flattened arch. This poem is written in Leonine verses, uh, that is, verses whose line endings rhyme with a word in mid-verse, an extremely popular metric from late antiquity onwards. Nonetheless, 18 lines are crammed into eight willy-nilly to fit the lintel. 
Hexameters at the beginning and end of the poem record the motives of the building and the genealogy of the patron and his legacy. The most cited lines are those at the beginning. Nikolaus, whose mansion this is, was not unaware. The glory of the world feels of no importance, yet it, it was less vain glory that drove him to make this more to renew the ancient splendor of Rome. The final lines instead acknowledge Nicolaus' parentage and pass the baton, the tower, to his son, David. That this dynastic message is almost in the form of a will and testament. However, the core of the poem is in elegiacs, and this is a meditation on mortality. In beautiful houses, keep in mind the tomb, trusting that you will not stay there, you will not stay long there or dead. Death comes on wings, no life lasts forever, our stay is short and its course is fleeting. If you outrun the wind, if you bolt doors a hundred, if you command lictors a thousand, with death you still sleep. If you stay in a castle and are near to the stars, thence the quicker is she, la morte is feminine in Italian, uh, the quicker is she used to snatch whomever she fancies. So it's a, a rainy night in the dark ages. We hear beating wings, uh, the echo of the tomb, life is short, Palaces are really tombs. Death will snatch you from your bed, however high your tower, and your tower will fall. These verses belong to two traditions in poetry. The first reaches back as far as the Egyptians, but it was familiar from the classical tra tradition, namely the eternity of poetry over the transience of earthly monuments. The quote on everybody's lips came from Horace, who said that his verse was itself a monument more lasting than bronze and loftier than any pyramid, all of which, all such monuments, would eventually succumb to elements, the flight of years and the gnawing away of time. Or it says it happens was right. The tower is a ruin, but the words remain. The idea that constructing a poem was like composing a building was also a long durée. And the dialogue between solid buildings and immaterial words became electrifying when the verses were inscribed on the very monuments that they were supposed to outlast, as in the case of our tower. Secondly, this poetic caveat on the transience of things belongs to a genre of vanitas poetry that also goes back to the origins of the, uh, the medium, recurs in the classical poets and in all those poems of late antiquity that enumerate all the things you might covet and which will bring you down in the end. This poem, this part of the poem, the elegiacs in the center, has all the air of having been excerpted from an anthology. The tenor of the text recalls ancient tomb inscriptions many in verse that one still found on the consular roads leading into and out of Rome, especially those inscriptions that address the passerby. And because in our inscription, the Casa de Crescenti, there are no Christian references, there is actually nothing to interfere with this transmission from pagan antiquity. The fact that the tomb spoke also alluded to the lingering presence of the dead. Hmm. There we go. Not only that, there's a genre of, of poetry which makes a good analog to the uh, spolia on the building. This is the genre known as the cento, uh, a word in Latin which means pack patchwork and signifies poems that are made up entirely of quotations from earlier poets. Now, I thought rather than inflicting um, a Latin version of this on you, I would show you an example in English from a modern poet, um, and you can get the drift there uh, immediately. Even the title of this poem, 
is actually borrowed from an earlier poet. And this is a fraction of it, by the way, it's quite a long poem. Now there's a thousand, and it's called the Dong with a Luminous Nose. Um, there is a thousand year gap between the heyday of the Cento in late antiquity and its revival in the 15th century, though they were still read. And memorizing line endings and line beginnings was and still is a method of learning poetic composition in Latin. Not unlike the house, the poem is an effort to perform at a high level within, culture, within a culture admired but resurrected from fragments. Now, the inscriptions on the house of the Crescenti are virtually unique. Verse inscriptions on the outside of any buildings in medieval Rome are rare enough, let alone secular ones, let alone at this length. The Nicholas, son of Crescens and Theodora, obviously set great store by literacy and literature to put, put such a long poem over the main door of his house. The only real comparison comes from a yet more massive tower house, uh, the Tor dei Conti in uh, right by the Forum of Nerva. The building we should see today is a, once again a stump, this time of a tower that was twice as high before it was decapitated by earthquakes in the 17th century. Its present bulky profile also dates from the 13th century, oh, and the 17th and the 1930s. Um, but most of it's actually uh, 13th century. But all this masonry was wrapped around an earlier tower, almost certainly built in the previous century, in the 12th. Then, as Roberto Meneghini has hypothesized, an exedra in, uh, oh, here we go, an exedra in uh, Vespasian's Forum of Peace was walled in and a tower built right above it, maybe a beanstalk in proportion, but with a firm footing. It is from this phase, the first half of the 12th century, according to the paleographical analysis of Alessandro Delfino, that an inscription survives written in hexameters and which seems to be in dialogue with the Casa dei Crescenzi, although one cannot say which inscription spoke first. The lettering and ligatures are far more elegant than the crude epigraphy of the Casa dei Crescenzi, but the message is a little more brutal. This is the house of Peter, full faithful to Nicholas, that warrior, vigorous, loyal, and most strong. Think carefully, O Quirites, who wish to pass this, how strong it is within, how immensely constructed without, that not a one of you could ever say. Although there's little uh, way of knowing what the exterior looked like when this inscription was cut, the interior is relatively well preserved. Uh, made from huge blocks of marble, well set and drafted, and justifying fully the phrase, how strong, uh, how strong it is within. Again, it seems to be the tower that speaks to us directly, warning us that if we wish to get around it, we had better take note of its strength. And the final line throws down the gauntlet to any rivals, perhaps to Nicholas son of Crescens and Theodora, to prove that they can do better. However, considering the ruin wrecked on the Torre dei Conti by the forces of nature, there's only half of it left, I think the Casa dei Crescenzi has the last word when it recognizes the transience of these hubristic homes. As another exhibit by Robert Montgomery in our exhibition, at Hay on Y proclaims, all palaces are temporary palaces. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, well, uh, that was a, a fitting end to our course on ancient Rome. We've heard about a lecture on the 12th century, which has highlighted uh, so many themes that we've all become familiar with uh, during these uh, eight weeks uh, dedicated to Roman antiquity. So we've talked about architecture, uh, epigraphy and poetry, indeed, uh, speaking monuments, sculpture, spolia, topography, uh, but also uh, enigma and mystery uh, and uh, a little bit of uh, problematizing as well. So it's this cultural continuity uh, that Fabio has emphasized, which I think is one of the main factors that most of our students are going to take back to the, uh, the UK with them. Now, uh, there's also uh, a paradox here in the sense that uh, whilst so many of those themes are familiar uh, to medievalists and to uh, antiquarians looking, looking at Rome, uh, the actual house, the Casa de Crescenti, is, as Fabio has uh, shown us, absolutely uh, unique in terms of its decoration uh, and even the inscription, which, um, uh, as he says, uh, outdoes uh, the Tour de Conti. So we've got um, all sorts of things to talk about, uh, based both on uh, antiquity as well as the Middle Ages and uh, even um, uh, modernity as well. Uh, and while people are thinking about uh, questions, um, one thing I'd, I'd like to mention, uh, noting the, the photograph you showed of the, uh, the inscription over the window, or rather over the lodger, uh, it seems to have, is it those um, sort of snake uh, skin uh, yes, it does, uh, reflections yeah. on, the on, the, on the under yeah. arch, yeah. Um, which made me think, um, you, you didn't say anything about the interior of the building. Is, does that help <laughs> us in any way uh, in um, thinking yeah. about... Uh, well, not so much what it was used for, but uh, any peculiarities of uh, yeah, I, I, um, or anything else like that. I, I was worried I was going to go over the way. <laughs> the interior is really unusual, actually, because the uh, when you go into this, uh, you go into a porch, basically. The, there's a wide lintel covering the um, entrance onto the Via Petra Sede, you know? and there was a, a door around the corner, which of course was originally open as well. So it's 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 really more like a porch than a vestibule, and going off that is quite a wide stair, which um, reaches a landing, which is where that arched window is, uh, and then turns up and takes you to a very very large and sort of double height um, room uh, at the top. Each wall of which was originally a sort of flattened apse. So that's that's quite extraordinary for a tower house, anyway. But what's very interesting about the staircase is that the uh, soffits, um, so the, uh, the ceiling of the uh, stairs you go up, is made from um, what they call cassetton, um, coffering, yes. yeah, uh, marble coffers, uh, which are antique, and I think one uh, one or two of them have also been thought to be medieval um, copies. So there's there's a ceremonial stair, and as you said, you've got the 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 um, scales are on the inside of the on the soffit of that arch, um, and yeah, it was. I don't think it was ever closed. Uh, and it, it were that window not there now, standing on the street, you'd be able to look up and pass the guy if you had the right light. <laughs> you'd be able to see these coffers. So it's it's a it's a it's a ceremonial step, and I don't actually know another one. In a, in a medieval tower. I'm not an expert, and I should say, and I haven't done my homework completely, but I can't remember having seen them before. Uh, do we have any uh, comments from our audience? We're overwhelmed by the 12th century. Thank you, Fabio. Excellent lecture, as always. Excuse me. Um, you showed a series of initial capital letters yeah. on the building. Did you say that people have attempted to? expand and translate those or did you say it's virtually impossible i didn't quite catch you you the said about inscription that. over the doorway or the inscription. yeah the principal um, inscription there have been numerous attempts i mean there's actually quite uh there's uh, now a very um good transcription of it actually it was published about 10 years ago by so it's a tower expert medieval tower man. oh lorenzo bianchi bianchi um so so that and and that was he can you know he conducted autopsy and his analysis of the text is you know completely convincing 
the problem's more with the um, how you translate it, actually, because the grammar is uh, is ungrammatical. The syntax is very weird. Um, I've been over it several times, you know, with Paul Gwynn, um, and. Uh, It's quite clunky Latin. Sure. Is there any chance we can see the slide again, just with those initials? Sure. There was a series of initials to the left and the right. How do I get this going? Yeah. Are you talking about the second one? There, there was a series of just capital, like groupings of capital letters. Yeah, the um, the ones which I, I had the yellow text for. You're talking about the Casa yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Yes. Uh, We'll pull those up. That one. Yeah, yeah, those ones there. There you go. So, how, be my guest. <laughs> yeah. So, how does one even attempt to open those up? Shall we say? Well, I, I don't. I don't know how you could. I mean, lots of people have tried. There've been lots of. Um, expansions on those so if you've got an n in there that automatically becomes nicolaus you know t automatically becomes theodora we got d for david yeah we've got three four d's so um i loved them a lot i don't know i mean people have tried but uh you know they don't correspond to the kind of abbreviations you'd find in roman epigraphy so you know without the without the the cipher um it's anybody's guess, and people have guessed a lot, and uh, none of it's really credible. Thanks. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Um, you uh, you contextualize the, the building of the Casa de Crescenzi with the rebuilding of Santa Maria in Trastevere in the same um, same century, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, in the, in the the groupings of inscriptions in the narthex of Santa Maria in Trastevere, is, are there any poems of a similar nature or composition? In those, no, I mean, that's the, the poems in the narthex were stuck up there in the 18th century. It's one of the sort of first um open air Christian museums. Um, and they're mainly from the catacombs, aren't they? Almost entirely from the catacombs, Central yeah. Yes, um, I think I think there is some verse actually on them, I think they're all, all prose, but I haven't, I haven't gone into that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, you, you mentioned uh, that interesting description of the uh, Palazzo del Senatore and the Mirabilia. Mm. Uh, does the Mirabilia give us any other clues about the um, the area of the Forum Bar and the Casa de Crescenzi? Uh, yeah, well, I was reading it on the plane yesterday, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and the description of the uh, Forum Bar in, strangely doesn't mention the mouth of truth, which you think they would. Um, but it misidentifies every temple. So the round temple, it says this is the temple of Faunus. Uh, and it's, it describes the palace of Lentulus. And the palace of Lentulus is actually a, an arch, um, Augustan arch, which made it into the 16th century, I think, or certainly the 15th century. And that's quite, that was quite near, as, as, as far as one can guess, or as far as Corelli can guess, rather, um, quite near the um, the round temple and in that description it says on the other side of the palace of Lentulus is is the temple of Bacchus it says where the the tower now stands is the temple of Bacchus and it says it's the tower of Cencio di Odeligua I think and um, it, it's possible that could be the tower for the Arch of Janus as well but I've got the feeling it might be this. Does Bacchus appear in any of the spolia? Or... Well, it's, I don't think there's a, a vines or anything. Uh, there may be, maybe. maybe. Uh, yeah, we have a question from Chris Ritchie at the back. I should check. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, do you have any thoughts on who the audience is for the inscription in that is this a vanity project that it's the family that's meant to read this is it okay i don't know in medieval if you're a medieval senator do people come to your tower 
and you conduct your business there. So it's peer to peer, or is it a general passerby that you think this is directed towards? Well, um, one of the descriptions, the one on the road to the bridge, is definitely directed to passers by. You know, it says sacos, you know, those who pass by here. Uh, as for, I mean, obviously the audience has got to be literate. Uh, if you believe the interpretation of Badger Rosla, they would have to be probably from the neighborhood and, and uh, had Greek and, you know, funny sense of humor. Um, but the, it's, it's a good question what the audience is. That's why I finished with the uh, Tour de Conti. They seem to me almost as though they're, you know, dueling inscriptions. Um, is it a vanity project? Yes, it is. I mean, that's, that's what it, it says about itself, you know. But it has to be somebody highly literate. I've looked through, I've tried to find sources for individual lines uh, in the poem and um, using my uh, good friend, Professor Google. And the, um, I think only maybe two words were from Virgil, you know, something about um, uh, mille cubicula or something like that, which I think is used of the Sybil, I think the uh, um, Sybil Cumai, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but otherwise it seems to be an original composition, which is strange because you'd expect some part of some line to show up. Um, and there's a big problem here, which is knowing what 12th century literary culture was in Rome, because I think that seems to be quite a dark area. But there presumably were libraries, not just monastic ones. And if you read the Mirabilia, you know, it begins by quoting Varro. Ovid is alluded to all the time, it includes Livy, uh, I can't remember who else, but five or six classical authors. So, yeah, that suggests there's, there's a you know, fluency and literacy uh, in the upper echelons, anyway. But what do I think? I think it's, you know, it's that, I think it's the house of the uh, um, big dog, you know, Patricius. And so, and there's, you know, maybe some, I don't know, false humility or maybe not. You, you, we've, we've sort of established this is unique in Rome. Um, and you showed the, uh, the small picture of uh, Castel del Monte. Uh, is there something, comparable in, in uh, 12th or, or 13th century Italy in general? Venice as well? Not, not, no, there, there are, I mean, there are inscriptions. Actually, the first one that comes to mind is on the corner of the treasury or San Marco, but uh, I think that's later. Um, but I, I, not that I know, do you? Uh, well, the only thing I was uh, thinking of, which is not comparable in terms of uh, architecture or epigraphy, was, was that tower in Tivoli. Um, which oh, yeah. I only read about it recently, the Torre di Colonna, which mm -hmm. has frescoes inside showing uh, a patrician of some kind administering justice. Uh, and there's very fragmentary frescoes of, of uh, Solomon. Um, and that uh, led the uh, the person who was publishing this, I can't remember their name, uh, to think of the, the famous tower in the Centro Quattro Coronati, mm -hmm. uh, the Alla Gothica with these incredible frescoes of uh, Solomon and uh, uh, great figures from from the Old Testament and Julius Caesar and, and other uh, other characters like uh, we know of from the Ubi Sunt uh, genre. But um, again, uh, we're in the world of fresco there, and, and the Casa de Crescenzi again doesn't doesn't have any. Uh, we have a question um, from John Halford, uh, who says, "Thank you. How was this area, the Casa de Crescenzi, perceived during the late Middle Ages, and were there any connections to the Savelli family?" Uh, who had converted the nearby uh, theatre of Marcellus? Well, there were I mean, there were a string of towers between this one and the uh, Teatro di Marcello. Um, but the, when did the Savelli go in? They're not the first. Is that still um, the French? I get mixed up. <laughs> um, so it's no, Pierleone nearby. I mean, well. there's definitely a connection in the sense that this is yet another example uh, of somebody using. Um, a, a massive ancient building, not just as a good foundation, but you know, presumably for um, any associations or, or connotations it brought with it. But there was that that whole literal was um, a patrician neighborhood, and I think probably the Casa Cascenzi is the last, well, the last of them before you hit open countryside. But it's it's um, all analyzed in quite great detail. 
um, the urbanists of that area uh, in Chris Wickham's book. So that's that's the Bible for that. May um, I? Um, something I really find fascinating is the overall brickwork, including both the proper masonry and also the architectural decoration of terracotta. The, the brickwork is super high quality. That is quite unusual for medieval times. I mean, we are used to seeing buildings usually made of reused material, whilst in this case, all, all the bricks are kind of same color, same size, and also the, the beds of mortar are really thin. And, and this is definitely evidence for investment in, in the construction of this building. So my first question is, are there any parallels for such an investment in the construction of a new building with maybe uh, purposely made bricks? And also, I, I really like the brick decoration that uh, reminds me of most buildings in Ostia Antica, especially the capitals. And even if I'm not an expert of medieval architecture in Rome and Italy, I have never really seen other buildings with, with this kind of architectural decoration. That's quite funny, I guess. Well, I think the, um, the, the sort of sporty brickwork is it's quite distinctive, isn't it, from the 12th century? What's quite unusual is the very flattened brick arch uh, yeah. over the door. But I'm not the expert on this, but I'm standing next to one. <laughs> uh, well, it, it's, it's certainly a bit late for me. I, I think the 12th century is is the, the key period in Rome for the revival of the uh, the brick industry. Um, and I'm not sure how much the, the Casa dei Crescenzi has fitted in with all the studies of churches, but they always point to Santa Maria Trastevere, which uh, yeah. was also the comparison for... Um, uh, for the spolia as, as well. We, we've got a question uh, from our online audience from John Osborne, uh, who reminds us that there is a short poem on the tomb of Alphanus in the porch of Santa Maria and Cosmodon uh, with a not dissimilar theme regarding the transitory nature of earthly splendors. Might they have been in dialogue, uh, of course, in this case with, a, with an actual tomb? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I'll, I'll nip over and have a look. I, I, actually, do I not take a photo of that a few years ago? Um, I don't know, John. It's a really good point. Um, I seem to remember. Am I, I? You can't respond, unfortunately. But am I right in thinking that the um, we you will correspond? But that the um, the epigraphy of the Alphanus poem is is quite similar to that of the um, the what's it called Tolte Conti. Anyway. He's right. shouting in, in Canada, he's screaming. Question from Christopher. Um, thanks very much. And thanks for the name drop as well. Um, I'm not really sure how correct this comment is, but really I just wanted to pick up on Chris's point about the audience earlier and just thinking about um, whether the inscriptions would have would have been designed to have different audiences in, in mind based on their level of level of abbreviation based on their uh, literacy and based on their position as well because the one on the side of the building was pretty accessible and pretty visible um but the one over the top of the window where you tried to decipher that the other day um in situ but it was pretty difficult to see and these nonsensical capital letters they seem to me to be some sort of a, an acrostic or a kind of a mnemonic really for people who maybe an abbreviation of verses or a passage that people would know by heart and they would be prompted to reconstruct the whole thing. Um, and also it might have alluded to their family member. And I see, I think it's pretty um, conventional for Nicolaos and DD. You could also see the abbreviation mark on the um, on the inscription. And that is that was also a, a conventional abbreviation for David. Um, yeah so and and yeah and the nic nick are put together as a monogram so i think that is pretty certainly nicolaos um and the dd is pretty certainly david um but yeah so maybe it was it was addressed to a familial context with you know people from the family who would have known what these abbreviations were for um 
But it's still very, I mean, you know, it's not Nicolaus Davidi Donum Dede or something, you know, it's. Sorry? So, Nicolaus David. Nicolaus David. Okay, so we're on a roll. Let's do the rest <laughs> of them. Ah, yeah, man. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, so we still got a, a little bit of time before our before our drinks. Um, we talked about contextualizing the uh, the monument in the Middle Ages, and we've also talked about the uh, the precedents. Um, bearing in mind your, your your project at the moment on uh, architecture and poetry, uh, how do these uh, talking palaces? Uh, developed uh, specifically in Rome, but perhaps elsewhere as well, uh, addressing the viewer in, in say, the later periods like the, the 15th century. Is there, is, there, is there anything that this leads to, or which even looks back to this? Um, no, I mean, there is in literature, but when you actually try and find real, you know, actual palace buildings that have um, poems on them, you might get a snatch of verse or something, you know on a palace uh, facade in Bologna or, or Venice. But to actually have a you know 18 line poem um you know in two meters, uh I don't really know what there is after or actually before. You know, it just seems really uh it's, it can't be a one off. It isn't a one off because we've seen the Corte Conti. That's a much shorter poem and um um actually you know uh the grammar's even worse in that one than this one um so no it doesn't i got interested in this because it's so exceptional not because it's part of a you know long durée and i'm very interested you know and because of the if this is mid 12th century it's, i think that's the only dating that really makes sense for it um then it seems to belong to these kind of you know the um seems to have the same kind of enchantment to it, uh, as what you read in the Mirabilia. And in that sense, if you look forward, I guess you could look forward to the Hypnerotomachia polyphily, you know, or any number of kind of travel accounts of people who find inscriptions. Sorry. Lila. Um, I'm free associating here, um, but I'm very struck by the name David. I don't think it's a common name uh, in 12th century Rome. It might be worth checking the lexicon of, uh, of Roman onomast uh, onomastics from the period. Um, the, what, there are two reasons that it strikes me. Uh, the first is that here we're quite close to the uh, Casa de Pierleoni, who of course were absolutely central to the Renovatio Senatus. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we're also really close to the cemetery on the Aventine, and here my chronology is terrible, but the, the other place where I think of talking inscriptions, not on buildings, but in funerary contexts, is uh, the, the beautiful Jewish uh, headstones that are made out of reused capitals. Now, the ones whose inscriptions I know are from a later period. I think they're from the 16th century. I don't know if there's an old tradition an older tradition uh, that goes back to, you know, whenever that's, I'm here again, I'm pre-associating. But I'm just wondering if that's something that's worth investigating, you know, David being so uncommon. Yeah, it, it occurred to me, actually. Yeah. Uh, and I wondered about that, especially because there are um, further up the river uh, where the ghetto was eventually founded, you know, there were two or three uh, more than sorry, sorry, you can't hear me. Um, further up the river, where the ghetto was eventually, you know, enclosed, um, there were several tower houses there. But it's really just a kind of association, and uh, it, you know, it might it might explain why they're not Christian uh, references in the inscription, but nor are there any about fearing God or uh, you know, um, which you might expect. Also, I don't know what the status was of Jews in Rome in the twelfth century. Um, whether this was permissible, this kind of display, uh, and cheek by jowl with the kind of families you're talking about um, as well. Yeah. Right. So you think it's a, it may be a Christianized Jewish family? I mean, it's, it's a 
yeah, it's worth looking into. I don't really know how I'm going to be able to do it, but um, since you know, maybe I will with that thought in mind. You know, find something new. Okay, so uh, I think we can uh, draw a veil now over the enigma of the Forum of Orion, uh, and to uh, cheer up our rainy night in the dark ages, we'd like to uh, invite you all upstairs for a drink uh, after thanking Fabio again for this uh, wonderful medieval enigma. <laughs>